Welcome to IPOPI Hot Talk. My name is Martine Perjean. I am the president of IPOPI, and this is my pleasure to moderate this digital event. Nizar? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Dr. Nizar Malani. Welcome uh, to this uh, IPOPI Hot Talk. I'm the chairman of uh, the IPOPI Medical Advisory Panel, and I'm uh, very glad to co moderate this event together with Martine. First, let me uh, take a moment to thank our sponsors, Farming, for making this event possible. Before we start, as this is this, uh, our second edition, I will take a moment to briefly explain the Hypopi Hard Talks concept. With Hypopi Hard Talks, we will explore the complexity of our field with the help of two experts, a presenter and a challenger, who will both bring different perspectives the presenter will give a talk, after which the challenger will open a stimulating debate. The, the theme today is APDS diagnosis. To encourage in this discussion, I am delighted to welcome our challenger today, Professor Stephen Jolles from the United Kingdom. Professor Jolles, you are a consultant clinical immunologist and honorary professor at the University Hospital of Wales. And our presenter today is Dr. Jacques Riviere from Spain. Jacques, uh, you are a pediatric immunologist dedicated to rare diseases and the humanization of medicine. Currently, in addition to providing care for patients with inborn errors of immunity, uh, Jacques serves as the clinical coordinator of the Advanced Immunology Testing Laboratory within the Infection and Immunity in Pediatric Patients Research Group at Valdebron Research Institute in Barcelona, Spain. Welcome to both of you. How will it work? Victor Rivière will soon give his lecture. After the lecture, Professor Jolos will share his comments and together they will discuss and debate this topic. During the presentation and the discussion between our two guests, you will be able to send written question in the question tab. So let's begin. Dr. Riviere, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Nisa. The pleasure is mine to be here. So first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be part of uh, an IPOP hard talk. Um, so my name is Zach, as uh, Nisa introduced me. I'm a pediatric immunologist in, in Videbron, Barcelona, and today uh, I'm going to talk to you about the APDS. Those are my disclosures. So first of all, uh, what is APDS? Uh, APDS, it's a long world, uh, really hard to pronounce, but it's activated uh, P3 kinase delta syndrome. Uh, it's an inborn error of immunity, and it can affect uh, people from all genders. It's a very rare uh, genetic disorder that uh, causes a malfunction of the immune system. So uh, this malfunction is caused by pathogenic variants in two genes, uh, leading to APDS1 and APDS2 that we're going to speak about afterward. Uh, the two diseases, APDS1 and APDS2, that we uh, talk about as uh, one let's say disease if, because of the similarity, which is APDS, both are dominant, which means that uh, if there is an affected parent, uh, it has the chance to, to pass uh, to uh, her or his kids and 50% uh, chance. And uh, the, cause, the direct cause of the two APDS syndromes are whether there is a loss of function of uh, some regulatory unit or uh, a gain of function that uh, inflammates uh, the body and especially the lymphocyte. So, as you know, uh, our immune system uh, is everywhere in our body. So, uh, if we have trouble in the immune system, we can potentially have uh, damage, damage organ or uh, problems in every part of our body. So in APDS, it's, uh, it's basically on T cells, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, also in UK. And um, there is an impaired development where the growth and the function of the lymphocytes are not working properly. 
So that's the explanation of uh, why the cause, but this transfers to symptoms and uh, signs that uh, the people who suffer from APDS can have. So uh, mostly it's frequent respiratory infection, as in a lot of uh, inborn error the community. Also, and this is a hallmark of the disease, uh, and large lymph node or lymphoproliferation with enlarged speed and uh, that can go to a high risk of lymphoma. Another thing that uh, is uh, frequent also in, in APDS is sometimes patients have chronic diarrhea like IBD. They can also have liver damage or uh, developmental delay uh, as well as uh, severe or chronic uh, viral infection, especially herpes. So how do you diagnose the the APDS. So basically, you can do it uh, in, in different stages uh, from the more simple to the more complex the, that we're going to talk about it after that. But uh, it's basically by a genetic test that you take from blood or saliva, but also lymphocyte characterization and immunoglobulin dosage can help uh, to make a, a diagnosis approach. And uh, here I think that speaking of diagnosis, it's really important to uh, put uh, the focus on early diagnosis and the importance of it, because like in a lot of uh, inborn errors of immunity, when you are able to have an early diagnosis, you also have less organ damage in the long run, and you can treat with uh, some uh, specific drugs before. So the treatment of APDS, although it's not the focus of, of this talk, uh, I'm just going to briefly uh, state a few uh, words about it. Uh, so the treatment is basically a treatment uh, for all the, the symptoms that uh, I said before. Uh, so you can have uh, immunoglobulin replacement uh, if there is problem with infection and uh, hypogammaglobulinemia. Uh, there is some drugs also that you can have, like uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. And then there is uh, two kind of uh, uh, therapy, which are therapy trying to target directly the malfunction of the immune system and, uh, and in the lymphocyte and in uh, all the pathway, uh, which are uh, now approved uh, FDA lenosity, for example. Um, and uh, we have the only curative uh, treatment uh, for APDS, uh, which is for now a uh, bone marrow transplant, but also have a lot of uh, pros and cons. So it is important to know that uh, although APDS can be managed in, in different centers, it's really important to use uh, the network and uh, the, the reference centers because those are complex diseases. Uh, and the management is, is, is not easy. So if we want to offer the best uh, for the patient who suffer from APDS, uh, it's really important to, to count on the reference center, both for diagnosis and then for treatment. So uh, I'm not going to explain a lot of uh, more info on APDS, uh, on the clinical manifestation, or maybe like the, 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 all the diseases, because uh, this was a wonderfully uh, done by IPOPI last year uh, by uh, Virgil Dam and Mariana Macari uh, explaining all IPDS. Uh, but that's not all, obviously. So um, we are uh, talking about diagnosis, and uh, diagnosing IPDS is really challenging. Uh, sometimes it can be kind of uh, easy, but uh, it's still a big challenge. It's a big challenge uh, starting with uh, diagnosis delay and uh, awareness, but it's also a challenge in a reference center and with uh, advanced uh, tests. So uh, we're going to go now and, and see uh, a bit of that. So the first thing, as I was saying, is uh, the lack of awareness. Uh, APDS is known it's not known from a lot of uh, people that see a uh, person that can suffer APDS, uh, that can be a general practitioner, that can be a immunologist, that can be 
hematologists, pneumologists, etc. So uh, as you all know, the PID community is uh, is uh, really um, struggling and uh, doing a lot of effort uh, to, uh, to to raise awareness uh, on APDS and on other inborn error of uh, immunity. So that's the first. Uh, the third thing you have to, to know, uh, because you cannot diagnose something that you don't know it exists. Then there is the complexity uh, regarding the, the sign and symptoms. You know that there is this sentence that I, I like a lot, that patients do not always lead the, the literature and present with typical sign and symptoms. Uh, and that is true. Uh, APDS is a relatively new um, um, disease. So at the beginning, uh, when it's a rare disease and it's relatively new uh, that we know ab about it, uh, we have just a few hints and we think that all the patient will present with that kind of manifestation of that kind. And now with all the genetics and that we know more about uh, APDS, we know that it's not exactly like that and we have a whole heterogeneity of uh, symptoms and signs. So uh, one beautiful paper uh, from uh, Maria Elena Macari uh, from the SHG registry was uh, published uh, last June with uh, the records of uh, 170 patients uh, with APDS uh, from 46 uh, European centers. And it really goes in, in depth uh, explaining uh, symptoms and signs of uh, APDS. So I'm going to go quickly. I'm not going to go uh, because I think it, it would uh, be really long, but just a few hints of uh, the complexity and, and the thing that we thought uh, that can be there or not. So uh, it's basically infection, as I said before, or infection with uh, immune dysregulation. That's uh, all those charts are at, at, are at diagnosis, so it's not in all the life of a, uh, of a person with APDS, but uh, on diagnosis. Uh, lymphoadenopathy is, is, is really uh, usual. Uh, it can be with uh, swollen nodes, or it can be also with planomegaly. Uh, and we have afterwards the thing that uh, are most preoccupying, which is a malignancy. Uh, mostly uh, lymphoid malignancy, but also others. So also uh, on the labs uh, before uh, this paper and others, uh, there was like a typical, uh, let's say tri triad uh, of uh, APDS with uh, high transitional B cells, low naive C uh, CD4 cells and high ITM. Uh, and with uh, with this report of the acid registry, we can see that it's not always like that, and it's not straightforward. So you cannot rule out a patient who has uh, normal ICM uh, because you think that all APDS have patient have uh, high ICM because as you can see it's about forty percent. So moving forward, I have prepared a bit of a different scenario from the genetics and, and also what you can see in real life in the clinics. So the first one is, uh, I call it easy peasy. Uh, so it would be uh, a person with a classical symptom, let's say lymphoproliferation and uh, recurrent infections that has uh, high IgM, high transitional B cell and low CD4 memory. Uh, T cells uh, and uh, you have access to genetics and you do a genetics and you find uh, a non really destroyed pathogenic variant in APDS. So uh, it's easy. That's uh, uh, a person with uh, diagnosis uh, confirmed of APDS. And now the tricky thing is uh, how you treat it and what can you offer him. Etc. Etc. But on the diagnosis side, uh, which is the, the focus of, of the talk today, it's the easy one. Then we will have the easy one with sometimes not that classical symptoms, but you can have, for example, uh, splenomegaly uh, and some 
some infection, but not like a classical lymphoproliferation. But then you do the lab test and you have like the classical uh, lymphosubset, but you will have IgM uh, normal or low. And then you do the genetics and you have, again, an already described pathogenic variant that it's known to cause APDS. So that's easy because you have uh, another uh, diagnosis of APDS. And as you see in both scenarios, the important thing is uh, the genetics. Then you have the third scenario, uh, which would be a Padawan level, where you have like classical symptoms, you have classical lymphocyte subset with uh, high IgM, and so you think, oh, I think that maybe the patient has a diagnosis of APDS. And then you go to the genetics and you have a novel pathogenic variant. So if it's not described, it's hard sometimes to know if uh, this variant um, uh, would be uh, causing of the disease or not. And then you can have the same thing, but not always with classical symptoms uh, and not classical lymphocyte subset. And you can have a variant of uncertain significance. Sometimes it looks like pathogenic variant, but it's not already described. So you have to go and validate it. So that's GDI level. And then uh, the, the fifth scenario uh, I would like to share with you if you when you have classical symptoms, but you don't have uh, genetic available, which is not so uncommon. Uh, so we know that uh, the access to genetics is, is a challenge. So uh, what can you do? So uh, on the third and the, the fourth scenario, it's basically uh, you have to try to validate uh, this pathogenic variant that you think you have in, in PI uh, key three CD or R one, um, and and to do that you have to go to the pathway and think how the pathway is, and uh, there is a, a a few uh, papers on that, uh, well, a lot of papers in oncology, but a few papers in 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 primary immune deficiency where you can see how uh, you can find on the pathway of. Um, APDS, so basically with the phospho AKT and the phospho F6 uh, diagnose uh, and, and validate uh, a mutation. So uh, as we uh, spoke earlier, uh, the pathogenicity of a variant will cause an excess of, of phospho uh, relation of AKT uh, and also an excess of phospho relation of S6. Uh, which leads after to a state of uh, inflammation and uh, alteration of the apoptosis and the survivor and the growth that causes uh, APDS. So the problem of this test is that it's not usually available in routine labs. Uh, in fact, it's not available in any routine labs uh, as far as I know. So it's always uh, on a research-based lab. So. Uh, this is uh, great from one point of view because uh, those assays are not that uh, straightforward, but it also has a problem to be um, on, on, the, on the mercy of uh, uh, grants on people who are doing uh, their, their PC, for example, or uh, the access to the center because of just a few centers ha have uh, uh, develop this this uh, kind of test. So there is a need here of standardization. Uh, some some people uh, do it with fresh blood. Other people do it with uh, T blast. Uh, so that's a, a question that can be raised. And then uh, there is some people do it with uh, looking for a first relation of AKT. Other people do it. Uh, only looking uh, at uh, successful relation, but it's important to know that uh, uh, cis x uh, cis s uh, first relation can be uh, activated by uh, an other pathway that are not uh, dependent of uh, PFK delta. So uh, also one aspect that is important is that sometimes you don't have, uh, let's say the 
the luxury to wait and to do science. So you have a patient uh, with a clinical manifestation that is uh, important and you start treatment uh, to this to try to uh, uh, decrease this inflammation and this lymphoproliferation, uh, as for example, uh, it has been uh, used and published uh, with uh, Cyrolimus, uh, which is an mTOR uh, inhibitor. And this has an influence also on the functional uh, assay. So uh, that could uh, lead to a negative functional assay. So sometimes you do it that first, and then after you go uh, to genetics or you go to functional assays. So it's not always easy. Um, regarding the fifth level, so if you don't have genetics available, uh, I think the, the best thing that you can do uh, when when you are in, in a center that you don't have uh, a good uh, access to genetics uh, is basically use uh, the clinical sign and also the flow cytometry. Uh, I know that it's not available in everywhere, but usually flow cytometry is easier to be available than genetics. So you can uh, try to see if you have the chance, let's say, uh, to have a classical uh, phenotype in the immunoglobulin and in the lymphocyte subset, and you can uh, sort of uh, diagnose uh, APDS-like patient uh, without a, a genetic confirmation. And then uh, I think the most important thing is, is to seek for advice, uh, seek for reference centers, and then try to collaborate uh, between centers to to go and uh, use. There is a lot of uh, opportunities to do genetics in in, in patients, so uh, international uh, grants, etc. So we we'll talk about that later. So in the end, there is also other things, you know, like uh, when you don't have a uh, classical symptoms, uh, you don't have the classical lymphocyte subset, and you don't have. Uh, the classical immunoglobulin dosage, and you have genetics, and you don't find any variant uh, in uh, APDS genes. Uh, well, think again. Uh, it might not be an APDS because not everything is APDS, but it might be APDS, uh, and you have to uh, seek sometimes uh, with for tricky uh, genetics or uh, intronic variants, etc. So my advice is to, again, uh, go back and, and, and speak with uh, reference centers and uh, help, uh, help each other. So uh, it's really important uh, for diagnosis of APDS, but also for a lot of primary immune deficiency. Uh, it's the lack of resources or accessibility or opportunities that uh, are uh, all around the world. And uh, in genetics and in uh, rare diseases, I think it's 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 really important and it's really a big challenge uh, that we're not quite yet there um, because uh, the access to genetics and there's a lot of uh, papers on that and, and a lot also a lot of uh, great um, uh, opportunities and, uh, and and initiatives like IPOPI does. Um, to, to try to uh, take the genetic test and other uh, tests in, in all countries. So my takeaway message uh, regarding diagnosis would be uh, really that think about APDS in CVID plus patient, uh, especially when they start uh, uh, in early age, before two years old or uh, around that. Uh, to do not rule out the PDS when all the symptoms are not present because uh, it's not that straightforward and some can develop uh, by time. It's really important to do genetic testing, but it's not always available. So seek for uh, genetic testing if you have or opportunities to do it in, an, in another way. And then again, share expertise, uh, try to reach uh, with reference network uh, for, for when you have tricky patients. And really important that the earlier diagnosis you do, uh, the, the more targeted therapy you can offer to the patient and the better outcome you, you'll have. 
So thank you, that's my last slide. Uh, thank you to uh, my team, my boss, Perasule, and all the other teams in the clinics and in the lab uh, and in genetics that uh, I collaborate. And especially, I want to thank uh, all the patients that uh, we follow here in our clinics, especially the one with APDS and their family and their caregivers. Uh, that's really uh, help us to, to see uh, all the pictures. And of course, uh, I hope for inviting me. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. I, I think that pleasure is all ours. And uh, thank you for this uh, great overview that really shows the complexity of this condition. And now, uh, Stephen, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, for, first of all, many thanks indeed for a really brilliant talk. Um, I was going to um, start off by maybe taking a step back because um, you talked about quite a lot of um, complicated testing there and uh, not everyone will have the same access to the force that uh, you described in your talk. Um, I'm just wondering whether you could just say a few words about the, a more global setting and the testing and we will cover lots of aspects but but some may I imagine not be available to all. Thank you Stephen. So yeah I, I think I think it's always hard when we think about uh, primary immune deficiency because uh, most of them uh, are uh, known to be caused by genetic mutations so uh, in the end the diagnosis is, is is easy if you is easy. Let's say if you have access to good genetics and and good labs uh, and just access to genetics, it doesn't even sometimes need to be really good. But uh, that's a challenge, and that's not a thing that is uh, available all around the globe. So uh, I think that there is some ways of collaborating uh, between uh, centers and between countries. I think that flow cytometry is a really good. Uh, uh, and power with, uh, powerful tool to have uh, uh, a first uh, lab test and, and screening and try to differentiate sometimes uh, between uh, different diseases. Uh, but of course, it's not always available or not always available as a complex level because it's not the same with, uh, uh, let's say, a, a regular flow cytometry where you see your B cell, T cell, and NK cell. And then when you have to uh, find uh, uh, CD4 memory T cells or transitional B cells, et cetera. So yeah, that's a big challenge, I think, for, for diagnosis. Um, with that in mind, um, and thinking now not even of a laboratory test, but just the patient in front of you and the clinical features that we might encounter, um, is there are there clues that would, uh, for example, pull them out from the background of, say, um, the other patients that you might see in clinic? And, and maybe if you could comment as well on the two types that you mentioned uh, of APDS and, and the clues there. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, yes, I think there is a few hints. Uh, the, the bad news, I would say, is that it's not that easy to, to differentiate uh, clinically. Uh, so, uh, yes, there is a few things like lymphoproliferation, for example, is really frequent in APDS and uh, other diseases that can look like APDS uh, in the, let's say, CVID uh, um, uh, overall uh, diseases like, I don't know, CDL4 or uh, STAT3 gain of function of uh, NFK baby uh, and et cetera, that also have uh, lymphoproliferation, but it's really more frequent in APDS. But once you have a patient with uh, lymphoproliferation, it's really hard to know uh, which, which one it can be. Uh, so there is a few things uh, that, that, that can be, uh, that can differentiate, but it's, it's really, it's really uh, not that easy. Um, for example, lymphoma is really more frequent in APDS, but it can also happen in other uh, in, in other diseases uh, that I I just mentioned. Uh, 
then for example, growth impairment uh, can be uh, in APDS present, but it also can be in step three GOF, but you can, you, you can think that, uh, for example, NFKP beta um, one uh, uh, has usually no growth impairment. So you can like try to take one and another, but there is no uh, big, uh, thing that will help you to rule out quickly. I think I think that lymphoproliferation is really a hallmark of uh, APDS, but it's not the only one. I think that maybe um, the low CD4 naive T cells on the labs are uh, more frequent uh, in APDS uh, and th than in other similar clinical diseases. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be like really uh, uh, keen to say, okay, if, if he has that, 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 and that is an APDS and that's it. And if you're just thinking of the, the clinical things, first of all, um, you mentioned the, the lymphoproliferation, but uh, one of the areas that we really concentrate on is, is the lungs. And um, within the cohort of CVID, um, we sometimes see the lymphoproliferation associated uh, with, say, glilid. And is, it wasn't on your slides. And I, I just wanted to ask whether that was an overlap or that was a distinguishing feature. Yeah, it's not, it's not that common in APDS to have uh, glids. So uh, that's, that, that, that's, but the problem is that you cannot differentiate with a patient with CVID that doesn't have glid that there is also. So yes, it's 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 a uh, it's a difference, and uh, and it's true that comparing to other CBID, uh, they do a lot of infection of recurrent infection in in, in APDS. So uh, a person that uh, suffered from APDS usually have bronchial disease. So that's also uh, something that you can look for. But again, it's quite common, uh, especially in adults. Uh, uh, to have uh, bronchiectasis when you have a CVID because of the late uh, diagnostic and uh, or the diagnostic play and the, the recurrent infection. So maybe, um, yeah, I would say that uh, in patient, especially pediatric patient with bronchiectasis and with uh, infoproliferation, uh, you, you have to think about APS also. Uh, one of the things that is different uh, uh, between APDS and other uh, primary immune deficiency is the, the, the early onset. So APDS has, has, an, has a really early onset uh, around one year, one year old. Uh, so it's not quite common to have a CVID light patient starting already at one. Uh, a lot of them start uh, later in, in, in life. So that can be something that uh, makes you, uh, uh, let's say, uh, light the bulb or the alarm. And, and so the just on the bronchiectasis that you mentioned, that it sounds like there might be something around the speed of development of bronchiectasis and possibly severity that would even separate you out from what some people call an infection only phenotype in CVID? Do you, is there the sense that that would be a, um, not the only clue, but a clue to pull that diagnosis out? I, I, I'm, to be honest, I really, I really don't know if it's due to really recurrent uh, infection and early and a lot, a lot of infection that, that make uh, you have bronchiectasis earlier, or if there is some kind of uh, inflammation and, and, and recurrent uh, inflammation and problem with uh, uh, a good apoptosis and, and, and that, that makes uh, the bronchiectasis develop uh, faster than, let's say, uh, a classical uh, humoral deficiency. And, and just sticking with the clinical, the lymphoproliferation, is there again in children, the, the airway can be affected by that. And 
uh, things like surgeries required for tonsils, um, snoring at night, are there features that would make you again as a pediatrician um, think of that diagnosis aside from maybe um, some of the others? So uh, yes, I think there is uh, maybe not surgery for tonsil because it's quite common, but usually patients with uh, APDS have really um, like impressive, I would say, uh, for lymph nodes enlargement uh, and cervical lymph node enlargement, which is the most common lymph node enlargement and that uh, uh, every other kid can have uh, in, in, in a normal, uh, in, a, in a flu or something like that. But it's true that they're really persistent and they're really big. I mean, uh, we had patient with APDS and it's, it's, it's not the usual uh, lymph node that is small and then go away and come back. And so it's something that I think any clinician, any pediatrician would be, uh, would be uh, impressed by. It's not a common thing. And um, on one of your slides, and I maybe hadn't uh, really noticed this before, but there was a, um, it looked like a significant increase in skin disease. Is that something that, um, again, might be a clue? Yes, but it's, it's yes, but it's quite uh, in a specific. So it, a lot of uh, skin disease from APDS, it's uh, atopic dermatitis. So it's, it's the most common, let's say, uh, skin disease uh, that, that I'm not a dermatologist, so don't don't, <laughs> don't take my word for that. But uh, it's one of the, the, the most common uh, skin diseases. So uh, I think it was something that was not uh, really picked up uh, in the beginning in the symptoms and sign of APDS, but that now we know. Uh, there can be some uh, uh, granulomas and also reactions uh, to the skin, but usually uh, so most of the, the, the skin lesion are uh, from uh, at the big dermatitis. Which is interesting in that um, allergy is more and more recognized as a manifestation of, of dysregulation in PID. And is that yes. that's the kind of thing you're describing? Exactly. Um, I'm just wondering as well, uh, whether there is uh, an aspect about growth that you feel would be helpful, may maybe most in children rather than adults now, um, that would make this diagnosis again be part of a, a pattern recognition. Yes. So, so regarding the growth, there is there is a growth impairment uh, in in APDS, uh, but it's true that a lot of primary immune deficiency have a growth impairment uh, and it can be directly because of some um, uh, mechanism on uh, GH, for example, but usually it's from a non-controlled inflammation and a non-controlled disease. So uh, in APDS, it's true that it's one of the hallmark of, of the disease, the growth impairment. Uh, but let's say in step three golf, who could have also uh, lymphoproliferation it's 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 more common and i was um uh mentioned as well uh, uh, something called short syndrome um, yeah. so short syndrome is uh another mutation in that pathway of uh, uh where ipds uh, as the cause and uh it it's uh a, a lot of a problem on the short syndrome are growth and uh, neurodevelopmental uh, aspects, uh, but only a few uh, patients with short syndrome uh, or not all the, the patients with short syndrome have an immunodeficiency associated. So it's really close to uh, the mutation where uh, there is APD, uh, causing APDS2. Uh, so the, the, so it's it, it's thought that uh, there is here like an overlap of the of the two diseases. Uh, and just 
at the last kind of clinical um, presentation we've got, you, you mentioned neurodevelopmental aspects. Uh, yeah, and it that's... may be important to tell us a little bit about that and maybe the two different types. Yeah, so that's that's uh, a lot more in common in APDS2. Uh, there is some uh, neurodevelopmental aspects and uh, behavior with sometimes uh, some uh, aspect of uh, of uh, in in especially in adolescent uh, uh, person who suffered from APDS with uh, psychiatric syndrome uh, or psychiatric uh, symptoms, uh, and also uh, sometimes just uh, a, a, a neural development delay uh, more more uh, broad, let's say. But, but it's more common in APS two than than APS one. And, and you would say not so common in, say, the others you mentioned, the CTLA-4 and F-kappa B1, that's not really a feature there? No, no, that's not really a feature. So that that can be uh, a hall, like a, a hallmark. But it's in all APDS, uh, it's it's less than a 15%, I think, or something like that. So yes, when you have it, it can help you, but it's not uh, the thing that, that, that would help you to diagnose uh, most of APDS uh, patients. And, and if I may, just turning now to the laboratory, um, could you just talk us through from a, if you are a, a, someone who has access to an immunology laboratory with the ability to measure antibodies, maybe vaccine responses and some uh, basic flow cytometry, what are the things there that you would kind of start to put into the laboratory pattern okay so maybe i think when you have a patient with clinical assignment symptoms that uh, can be compatible with uh, um, apds i think the first thing to do is is to do a uh, full blood count uh, check for immunoglobulin dosage uh, so it's not always that you have uh, hypogamma in apds uh, so sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't have it. It's more common on, on the other uh, uh, CVID or uh, 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 diseases that can have the same symptoms with lymphoproliferation and, and, and infection. But in APDS, it's, it's not that so common to have ipo um, uh, The books say that you should have a high IgM uh, Sometimes uh, you can have also high IgG, uh, IgD, sorry, uh, as a problem of maturation of, of B cells. So only with, uh, let's say, an immunoglobulin dosage and a food blood count, you could already have some clues of uh, whether you are in front of a patient that has a classical APDS or not. It doesn't mean that it has it or not, but I, at least a classical uh, APDS. Then I would go for uh, full cytometry and uh, lymph, lymph, lymphocyte subsets. And there uh, you can try to have uh, B cell uh, compartment uh, analyzed in depth. And then you can see if you have uh, CD4 memory T cell that are usually low in APDS patient. That's the, that's the the, the most common uh, manifestation in your lymphocyte uh, subset. Uh, and you can have an increase of transitional B cells uh, with uh, low, mem low memory uh, B cells. So you'll have uh, also, if you have access, as you said, to vaccine response, you can have also impaired vaccine response, but it, it's not always the case. So, so you could actually have normal immunoglobulins normal vaccine responses and bronchiectasis yeah so i mean i don't is, know how common is all all of these and bronchiectasis but it, yeah it, you, you could have uh, and thinking of the flow cytometric testing just to um you mentioned the low fours and if you have a little bit more um resource in your laboratory the B cell panel and the naives would also help. If you were to put um, 
the highest stringency, what, what parts of those would you say give you the strongest evidence pointing towards that diagnosis? I, I mean, I think that uh, the, the most common thing would be the low naive CD4 T cells. Mm -hmm. Although it's 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 kind of strange because it's more seen as a B cell dysregulation, although there is also the T cell dysregulation, but there is a big problem in the B cell compartment. Uh, but it's more common to have uh, a problem with naive CD4 T cells. But you don't you have I mean if you don't have genetics, that's not the only PID that you have to think when you have CD4 naive T cell low. I mean. <laughs> that's important to, to to have in mind and just just to help with the, the how low of those because that seems an important measurement but you haven't in the in the clinical slides the nature of say opportunistic infections viral infections warts the kind of is is it that they are extremely low or just in the kind of below the cutoffs no, they are low, and, and, and in fact, uh, in APDS, you have one of the classical manifestations is recurrent uh, or chronic uh, uh, viral infection, uh, especially uh, with uh, CMV and ABV. Um, but it's kind of in, in CTLA-4, and it's, it's less in other diseases like uh, STAT-3 cough. But uh, it, it's not... Uh, it's not the typical combined immune deficiency where you see a lot of opportunistic uh, infection. It's a lot of bacterial infection, a lot of uh, uh, staph arose, uh, pneumococcal uh, infection that leads to bronchiac disease, etc. And, and it's not a, a lot of opportunistic infection. And, and just that the hint that I think you're suggesting is that if we were to find EBV or CMV by PCR, even at a low level, it would put, this is a disease that can do that. Yes, I mean, it's it's a tricky one because, I mean, uh, EBV or CMV at a low level can be found in, in healthy individuals. So uh, I think we have to be really cautious here uh, and, and, and how to input interpret it uh, see if we have some lymphoproliferation due to EBV, for example, and then see whether you have a chronic EBV with like high uh, viral load, uh, because sometimes, uh, I mean, uh, anyone can have, uh, once he has been infected by EBV, can have a reactivation with a really low uh, EBV uh, virus. So chronicity and maybe higher levels. Um, yeah. I'm thinking now, just with time, that we need to consider genetics um, and the place of genetics and how likely genetics is to um, pick up this diagnosis. What would be your approach? Yeah, so genetics, I think now that uh, in, in APDS, uh, there is... Uh, I would say two challenges uh, about the genetics. The first one is the access to it, and I think that we, we, we covered it before, but it, it's it's the big challenge uh, is the access because uh, a lot of already manufactured panel or uh, exome, if you know about uh, immunology, I think you can find uh, uh, most of cases of APDS. Uh, the thing with APDS is not that at least for now, because maybe in two years we, we say otherwise, but uh, for now it's not that heterogeneous in terms of genetics. So uh, there is a few mutations, uh, both in, in, in APDS1 and, and then APDS2 is, is, is uh, more, more than that. Um, there's only a few mutations that are causing the that are known to cause the disease. And then the problem that you have is with uh, the variant of uh, uh, uncertain significance, because the one that are already uh, validated uh, account almost for uh, 
I mean, there is one who account for almost 90% of APDS one, for example. So it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, there is no challenge here. You have it, you have the disease uh, uh, and it's a disease compared to other disease that when you have the mutation, usually you have the disease. It's extremely rare uh, to not express the disease when you have the mutation. So on the genetic part, I think the big challenge is on the, the variance of, uh, of uh, uncer uh, uncertain significance. And then if you have all no, genetics, I think it's, it's, it's the same for every PID, uh, every inborn error of, immun uh, of immunity, uh, that uh, people, when they, when they say, oh, I have a genetic test and it was negative, I think that's uh, a sentence that we should erase from our uh, mm -hmm. language because uh, not every genetic test is the same. Uh, you have a, a really uh, different genetic test. Uh, uh, all are from your DNA, but uh, after that, it's different to have a panel, to have an exome, to have a genome, to have a long read, a short read, uh, etc. So, um, so I think that it's really important to uh, also to review patient that you are following. Uh, or for the patient to ask for a review or the, or, or the, of their genetic tests, uh, because uh, as 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 we say, I mean, a lot of uh, inborn error of of immunity have been described uh, in 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 the last ten years. So uh, it's important that if you had a uh, if you had a genetic test in like say it's seven years ago and it's not have been reviewed, you could have an APDS because for, for the time. Uh, that that it was on all panels, etc. Uh, you didn't have it. So uh, I think there is a few, a, a lot of challenge also in in, in genetics. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are just. Oh, sorry, uh, Steve, because we're coming to the end. I would like to address one or two questions, but maybe please go ahead. There is just a, a question about the functional testing and the importance and access to it and the use of that as well, to to round off. Yeah, I'm gonna try to be quick on on, on that one. Uh, I think it's it's a really hard one. Uh, I think that the test is not uh, standardized enough uh, from today to be uh, worldwide accepted, and uh, and it's still on a research base. Um, I think that uh, we should uh, learn or use uh, our colleagues in the oncology field uh, because. Uh, PI3 key is is is, is a, a big player uh, in oncology, and uh, I think we have to use their firepower uh, on uh, on test. As in immunology, I think we are smaller uh, in, in in rare diseases, um, so I think that would be really uh, a great step to take uh, as a community and, and and to collaborate more with uh, with oncology. Uh, so for now, I think. It's, it's only available in a few centers and it's not always working. So I think that uh, it's, it's, it's still on a research space. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I, we have many questions and thank you, Nisa, for answering them, most of them, no which is very helpful. Um, just, uh, I would like if you have any idea on the, on the uh, epidemiology, the prevalence of those uh, conditions. And even more, if they are uh, more present in some world regions than in others, is it possible to answer that question? So I'll I'll try to do my best, Stephen. You can also <laughs> bring okay. yours, but uh, I I mean it's really hard uh, for APDS to know the real uh, incidence uh, of it because it it looks a lot like an, uh, other diseases. Uh, Basically, the diagnosis is by genetics. So, if you don't have access to genetics, it's hard to diagnose from uh, to diagnose it. Uh, that's true. That like the biggest cohorts of uh, patients described with APDS are are around 200 patients. So it's not that that common. Um, but it's I think it's it's a a small big part of the CVID monogenic causes uh, of CVID and that the good thing is that uh, there is 
there is stereotypical oxygen. So I think it's important to diagnose it. Mm -hmm. So I think underdiagnosed would be right. Um, because lots of regions don't have access to genetics, lots don't have access to functional, and even when you have access to genetics, there are intronic mutations described now which may not be picked up by panels. So um, people have a figure of around one in a million maybe, but, but possibly actually it's more common because of our ability to um, not find it, and maybe not find it in the specialties where uh, it's not immunology because they can present to so many people. And, and uh, the difference between the two uh, types, is there any um, idea on that, the, the prevalence of the two of them? Type 1, type 2? Well, the prevalence of the two of them, uh, the APDS1, as, as far as I know, is more prevalent than APDS2, but sometimes uh, in 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 reach in some region I don't know why I don't know if it's from uh, underdiagnosed or just by by chance let's say uh, but uh, sometimes you have like in Spain we have a lot of APDS well we uh, in proportion we have a lot of APDS two uh, mm -hmm. comparing to APDS one but uh, I I don't know if there is uh, a data on really. The, the localization of uh, of the mutation and the prevalence, uh, because I think it's it's a problem of uh, under diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I think we had also a question on treatment, um, especially um, yeah, one from China, a Chinese patient organization who asked uh, when uh, APTS uh, patient has been transplanted, has is still the risk of having a cancer uh, a lymphoma. I mean, this is this is a, a tricky question because after transplant, uh, it depends on how the transplant goes and uh, how much of the cells of the receptor and the donor you have. So if you have a mixed chim chimerism, it's not the same if than if you have uh, a full uh, chimerism. But in in theory, and correct me, uh, Stephen or Nizar, if I'm wrong, but if you have a full chimerism uh, with all your lymphocytes are from the donor that doesn't have the mutation. You shouldn't have a lymphoma due to uh, APDS. You can have it uh, because of other causes, because secondary to uh, receiving some 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 drug for the transplant, etc. But uh, it shouldn't be uh, because of of, of the the, the hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed as well. Agreed as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Nisa, you want it? No. I said agreed as well. Agreed. Ah, <laughs> fantastic. So, uh, before we come to the end of this hard talks, I want to thank both of you for discussing APDS in depth uh, with us today. And uh, to Professor Jolis, to be such a good challenger, uh, and to Dr. Riviere for being very interesting talk and for all the answers that you have provided. Because we had many questions, but indeed in the discussion, you, you provided a lot of answers, which is fantastic. <clears throat> And we also have some track for the future uh, around uh, standardization for, for testing or things like that. And of course, uh, specialized centers, which is also very important from the IPOP perspective, of course. We will now sh also share a short uh, feedback form, uh, which should pop up on your screen, it is. And uh, it's very useful for us to know your feedback and to hear your comments to uh, continue uh, to improve this concept. Thanks again to all of you for attending the second edition of the IPOPI Hard Talks. In a few days, you will be able to watch it on IPOPI Web TV. And don't hesitate to share it as much as you can. Many thanks again to all and to our sponsor, Farming, for making it possible. And see you in our next IPOPI Hard Talks. Take care. Thank you.